I'm not going to continue the discussion of individual transformations at the moment. We can return to it in number five. Uh, one point I will make, though, is that there is a question of not being one-sided in development, of developing harmoniously. Now, that is a very difficult topic that I'm not going into. Uh, you have the notion of the lopsided artist or the lopsided scientist, and uh, one has to tolerate that. We are rather grubby questers, human beings. But a point I, I, I think that is important regarding what we might achieve through this course or through our search, our life, is at least find some zone where you can undergo transformation. Uh, I had a student once who used to play the trombone, and, and she, she got into that, and it transformed her, and it opened up a world to her, and in fact it kept her sane. And she got into her place, displaced into that world of music, by working on the trombone. The, the value of doing that, it's not merely the personal achievement of growth in a particular area, but the achievement of something that gives you a sense of what other people might be doing. You may have no vibes, say, in the field of sculpting or the field of nuclear physics, but because you have got into literature, you have some sense of what the other person has done, that they have found their place and it is not your place, and yet you can be companionable. Does that make sense? So, so you have a pattern of growth in one area, you call the ten areas of beauty we talked about, and that growth displaces you, let's say music, and recall what we said last week, it displaces you in a way that doesn't make you arrogant, but reverent. There's a way in which the displacement opens up further possibilities. Okay, let's say a few words about the communal transformation and the communal displacement. We have been talking about that pretty well all the time. Again, you can go back to that page 83 with the diagram of capacity and needs, institutions, and so on. And the institution that I focused on in this chapter is the institution of a collaboration, which you will recall merely by looking at our little diagram. I can use the keyhole diagram, but the one we used last week was this diagram of research, interpretation, history, dialectic, foundation, policy, planning, and executive reflection. An institutionalization of this as a process of collaborating, whether in the ecology or the economy. Uh, and the problem is to see the dimensions of that. And, and that's the point I just want to emphasize tonight. I'm not going into any detail. I want to indicate the dimensions of this enterprise in relation to rhythms, two types of rhythms. Economic rhythms and African rhythms. And again, remember our, our notion of peak at a peak, that sort of thing. Uh, people have asked me about the economic problem, which I connect with the notion of economic rhythms, and even suggested that why don't I spend some time 
spelling out this? Well, that would certainly be reaching way beyond the beyond. But what I'm going to do is risk a slight, a small exercise. What is the problem in economic theory? It's inattention to the mess and the rhythms which are natural to economic development. Now, it's a huge topic. Uh, the key diagram is on page 67 of Process. And that key diagram bubbled up in Bernard Lonergan's psyche, I think sometime in the early 40s. I mentioned earlier that he had spent 10 years producing these eight. Uh, he spent 14 years producing this diagram. And it's a diagram which has five circles. And this, this is sort of a zone of financial redistribution. And you've got two circuits that you can think of as say, capital goods and consumer goods. Now, all I want to do is intimate a problem that would seem desperately obvious. Now, the, the, the difficulty of the desperately obvious is that somehow, like these elements being desperately obvious, if you are educated in a certain way, you, you no longer see the desperately obvious. Does that make sense to you? OK, so let's take something desperately obvious, like an island. Let's take an island like Ireland, or PEI, whichever you prefer. Now, we need a little imagination here. You have, say, potato cultivation in this island. And it's way before the plow, OK? We're back. I don't know how far back. And let's think of Ireland, where horse racing is a big thing, the ponies. A horse racing of all description, like point-to-point -point horse racing. I remember being at one of these, uh, something you probably don't know in Canada, a point-to-point -point race where the horses take off and they, they go around the countryside and they go up and down over hills. And if you're you know, a, a really cute horseman, then you have somebody to replace in one of the woods on the way around. Anyway, so this island has horse racing and potato. The potato is the dominant food, and there's no plowing. And then one evening, the, the bank manager and the local doctor and the local farmer are sitting in a pub. But you know what a pub is, a public house, yes? Having a, a jar, as they say in Ireland. And suddenly, where it comes from, you never know. Suddenly, the farmer says, you know, this potato business, if I could only tie the shovel behind the horse, and, and instead of that, the horse would do all the work. Yeah, it's an idea. Bank manager said, that's a great idea. Let's go for it. What happens? OK, now, as I say, I'm just inviting you to think about something. You have two flows. You have two flows of goods. I represent them as these two spaces. OK. There's a flow of potatoes, etc., consumer goods. And there's a flow of spade manufacture, maintenance. And there's no invention going on whatsoever. OK. Then the night after the, the pub event, there has, be, there has been a bright idea shared by this group. And I put in the bank manager because he's part of this show. What happens in the next couple of years? 
Okay, I'm, I'm taking, say, a three-year span. Be realistic. You, you, you have a bright idea of the plow. You have to start putting together. Uh, last day I talked about liberating the idea. It was a very loose use. It, it's concretizing the idea which liberates. An idea liberates. Does that make sense? Uh, and it's wonderful when you think of the nature of salvation generally. We are saved by an idea, the divinity. Okay, an idea liberates, but it takes time to embody it in horses and harness and the structure of the spade when you change it into a plow and so on. A lot of work goes into increasing capital. Okay, so we'll, we'll draw that up like that. So you have a change in things that you can't eat. And in that shift, and I'm not putting it in here, but to, to maintain that shift, there has to be another flow of money. As I say, the bank manager is relevant. What's the farmer going to do all the time that he's retraining the horses and getting somebody to do the harness and somebody else to work on nails and so on? It has to be financed. Meantime, there are no more potatoes. Okay, isn't that fair enough? Yeah? Or you can take, I, I, I see you smiling down here, you can take it. The fishing industry, yeah? You get a new idea about, yeah? Well, while you're shifting the capital, well, there are no more fish. Now, ju just referring to the, the non-separation of these in the normal economy, if you're pumping money in here, as well as in here, all you're doing is sending the prices crazy. <laughs> we have more money, and we have no more spuds. OK. After a period, one or two years, you, you start having crops. OK. Now you have a shift. And notice there's a rhythm here. OK. And it, it's not in tandem with this. The, the more spuds come later. And what's happening then with the capital here? Well, we're, we're thinking of intelligence, <laughs> okay? Remember my point here about the, the function of the theologian. This is normative. Insofar as the community is intelligent, uh, this levels off. There are enough plows now to go around the island. Let's not talk about export inbuilt obsolescence, all the stupidity. Well, no, export is not a stupidity. But inbuilt obsolescence, we, we want to make more plows, so let's get worse wood, yeah? OK, so insofar as there's intelligence, there's a leveling off to, well, now we've enough plows, maintenance. There's a leveling off here. There's an acceleration here. And eventually, there's a leveling off here. Now, the, the point I'm making is that there are rhythms. The rhythms are natural. Isn't that pretty obvious? And it, it oscillates like that in this simple economy. And it's very close to the Irish economy in the 1840s. Uh, we lived on potatoes. Uh, you have a rhythm there and a rhythm here. And I put down the three-year cycle because these rhythms were investigated by people in the last century and the beginning of this century. And in fact, there are rhythms in the economy. One discovered by a Russian. It's a rhythm about 60 years. That's when you have a really mighty shift, like railway. And sometimes I, I think of, say, the map of Britain, the contemporary map of Britain. What did you do in the ra what did they do in the railway, uh, the surge? Well, you kept putting in small lines. If you look at the map of England, it's a network of 
uh, smaller and smaller pieces of railway. So I'm, I'm supposing intelligence that this levels off. 60, uh, Clement Juggler was the man who did a great deal of work on this in the 19th century, and he was a, actually a medical doctor. And there's a, a cycle of eight years related to his work. And the three-year cycle, two men, a chap called Kitchen and a chap called Crumb. And the point I'm making here is that these are natural rhythms. They're enormously more complex in, in a, an advanced context, but they are unavoidable. Now, I'm pointing this out because I did mention the last day that Nicholas Caldor said that things have not been right since... And last week I mentioned chapter 6 of book 1 of The Wealth of Nations. It's actually chapter 4, in case anyone rushed to the library to check me out. Uh, the, the interest in prices, the interest in balance, the interest that goes into the ISLM curve, uh, it doesn't handle the two flows. And it has other flaws, of course, as well. Changing the interest rate does not affect terribly much the shoemaker, who has a monthly turn turnover. But if you're making ships or aeroplanes, uh, a 1% shift over a two-year period, you're in trouble. OK, that, that was a, a, a small indication of the transformation required in economic thinking. You may think it's simple, and again, the analogy with this course, insofar as you haven't done enough economics. If you've done enough bad economics, you can't see your way through this at all. Now, again, people have asked me for references. Uh, there are some references on that page, but the main reference is to the collected works of Lonergan uh, about 1994. And that, that is an interesting date because he finished the manuscript in 1944. But it's not a welcome transformation. OK, the question of welcome, I, I'll talk about a little bit further down there. The welcome to the transformation of these eight, this functional specialization. The, the, the structure. In chapter 4, I brought out the parallel between this structure of collaboration and the collaboration due to the structure of the periodic table. Uh, periodic table emerged precisely 100 years before this eightfold structure. And it, it got into the chemical community within about five years. And now no respectable chemist goes around trying to avoid the periodic table. This structure is a structure for serious collaboration, facing the mess of theology. And there's a parallel between this sort of probability uh, messing and the messing that goes on in the real religious inquiry, which we'll come back to here. OK, my other rhythm, the rhythm of the economy, uh, the other zone of rhythms is the rhythms that are African. And again, think of this as a peak at a peak. But I, I couldn't wind up the course without pointing in this direction. The rhythms that are African. You remember when I started the discussion of the uh, division of labor that I had a family and there was Grandma Moses. And there was Uncle Cheng. And there was Molly. And there was Poldy. And I didn't give these the children special names, Jack and Jill. And perhaps some of you puzzled over these names. 
I'm thinking now of, say, Uncle Cheng. And I'm thinking historically, and I'm thinking of the man I've quoted a few times, Eric Vogelin. Eric Vogelin wrote five volumes on the dynamics of history. And as he worked on the last volume, which he never finished, he, he died writing this last volume that I, I quote in chapter 2.0, where he begins looking for the beginning of the beginning. But his aspiration was to search back through China for the roots of humanity. OK, Grandma Moses. Some of you may have noticed that this vibes with, if you like, a caricature of the black American, uh, what, what blacks would call the Jim Crow history. Uh, up till now, I haven't mentioned the African tradition of conviction. And I'm not going to go into it, but I'm just raising the question of the recollection of the past, uh, that there is something in the African tradition, Afro-American, the islands, uh, that has a richness that escapes so far the investigators of African religions. Uh, now, I, I can only hint at that in, in a very blunt way. There is an optimism in, in certain groups of, especially Africans, perhaps summed up in, in the words of Kenneth Kaunda from Zambia, uh, about the, the gift, the African gift of man enjoying himself. and Africa's gift, possible gift, to world culture. He says, let the West have its technology and Asia its mysticism. Africa's gift to the world culture must be in the realm of human relationships. And then he talks about the condescension of the colonialists. Uh, I know something about that, being Irish. And then he says, don't, don't the Learned people tell us that Africa was the cradle of man. The way things are going, Africa may be the last place where man can still be man. Now, the researches into African religion uh, reveal a tremendous model in the minds of the researchers. There's a view of religion that doesn't reach down into the heart reasons of the heart, the heart of Africa, that doesn't recognize the vitality of the African people. Uh, they, they want something explicit. And there's an enormous problem of shifting to a larger perspective related to the, the friendly universe. I won't go into detail on that. It's tremendous to read the, the Bantu and the Zulu and so on perspectives. This is a huge network of languages and cultures. That, that there's a root lang language group just like the Indo-European. And a huge range of vital groups. But to, to, to get back to a minimal point, I may come back to the, the African beauty under this question of cosmic beauty. But a very clear point that, again, you can notice from this trivial course. And again, I, I think of the question of arrogance. I'm not going to say where this book came from. But there are a lot of contributors. Page two at the top of the book the aim of the contributors to this book. They have lived for many years in Africa in intimate fellowship with Africans whose languages they speak and have diligently sought to get at the back of the black man's mind. Wow. My problem here is that they haven't diligently sought to get at the back of the white man's mind. What's a mind? Wouldn't it be a good question to start with? 
I, I think of so many other quips and quotations. There's a, a story I read yesterday of the old tribal leader who was watching the white hunter passing through the town. And he says, oh, these white men who have eyes and cannot see. OK, I could talk at length on African rhythms, whether it's the rhythms of the dance, the sculpture, the rhythms of the tongue, the bone. Uh, but there is something there to be collected and recollected and cultivated. And there's a sense in which we must look south. OK. Having said that, I return to the Indo-European tradition. And this is a quotation from the Rig Veda, the, the creation myth of the Rig Veda. The, the line before it says, thereafter there emerged desire, desire, the primal seed and germ of spirit. And this goes back to pre-1000 BC. And there's a sense in which now we're doing another exercise. And, and let's see how, how far we've got in 13 weeks. And let's think of the scholar who talked about the black mind. And another scholar I read yesterday or today who talked about the absence of desire in the African tradition. Well, if you are not of a, a type that has an interest in desire, you will notice, you will not notice. I think it's Lars van der Post that writes about the South African judge who could walk down the street and not see any black person. OK, this is a very early expression, the roots of Hinduism. And one has to think back to the primitive emergence of literacy in the northern Indian context and the carving out of these verses by somebody. This isn't like Homer. This is five, six, seven hundred years before Homer. It's just a magnificent line, the desire, the primal seed and germ of spirit. What did this person mean by desire? And how do you find out? I mentioned earlier that if you analyze the grammars of the Indian languages and work your way back to Sanskrit, you'll find the question forms And if you examine the remains of pottery and so on, you'll find the questing forms of art. But to find out what this ancient Indo-European meant by desire, you have to do our elementary reflection. I am desire. Now notice the problem that lurks behind the course. Uh, you can say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's OK now. L let's see now. Aristotle said, all men desire to know. Let's see what Plato said. What is desire? The, the drive of the course was to get you to notice that desire is just as difficult to investigate as electron What is an electron? I spent a lot of time in the 50s trying to find out what the self-energy of the electron is. It's a terrible problem. It's much worse now. What is desire? You're back at asking the what question. About the what question. And I'm following following up the point I was making the last day, that this is a challenge that is not faced in the West. And what I want to push today a little bit is the problem of the Oriental drive that follows through Hinduism and Buddhism and so on, and whether it is really friendly. Now, 
about. This is a difficult point. The desire, the primal seed and germ of spirit. I'm certainly not going to enter into an account of Hinduism or of the various traditions of yoga. There are four main ways. Uh, if I had my bear here today, we could talk about yoga bear. Isn't there a ball player, yogi bear? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, there, there is jnana yoga, semi-intellectual, and there's raja yoga. And I'm indicating here the possibility of a need of a transformation and an enlargement relating to our very first point, the conviction in the human and following up the friendliness. Okay, before we get to that, let's just take this as it developed in the Hindu tradition. You have this reaching, summing it up in a couple of words, Atman reaching to Brahman. And somehow the identity Now, what, what is this desire? What is this reaching? And again, back to the question of the Buddhist tradition. What is that reaching of the, the static, dynamic, formless self? And is it connected with the desire in the first line of Aristotle's metaphysics? And why is it that Aristotle got as far as a specification, understanding, understanding, and it doesn't become that explicit in the Hindu tradition? And is there a possibility of a development in the Hindu tradition? Let's go back to the desire, the, the concrete desire in the Hindu community, the holy person. And again, the question of, of the Indian tradition and its patriarchality comes up, and we can't deal with that. How does one cultivate this desire? Then you have the various developments of Hinduism, the break-off developments, so on, the, the, the sects that emerge, say, after the 6th century AD. Uh, the, the thing about the development of the Hindu tradition is that it, it seems to be more tolerant across the sects. I'm not talking about the castes, but more tolerant than, say, the Christian tradition, where Pascal's notion seems very true. Okay, you find that you are desire, and it is the seed and germ of spirit. And you talk about it, this, this is a line of a verse of a creation poem. You talk about it and you move around in the cosmos and there's a, 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 an implicit assumption that so far friendly. If talk is not friendly, stop talking. In other words, the desire manifests itself in expression, and the expression is backed up by some sort of insight. You get some sort of instruction, even if it's only the instruction to keep one hand clapping. It would seem consistent with the search for the desire to admit into the desire search a search into the strategy of cultivating the desire. Wouldn't that seem plausible? In other words, how, how do I go about this search? Well, the going about it is some way relevant to the realization of the desire. 
Now, I'm, I'm not going to plow through this at any great length, but I, I bring it back to an earlier point I made that if you want to know what what is, then okay, it would seem proper to take Aristotle's advice and Thomas's advice. How do you know what's what? Work it a little. <laughs> Let's see it run. In other words, the what is revealed in its achievements So you're asking what is what, not in a vague, blank-minded meditation, but in a meditation which takes in the achievements within the reality of you and the cosmos. So, so there's a, I'm enlarging on the notion that the cosmos is friendly. The strategy also is friendly. Attend to the strategy. Now there is the problem, which is both in Hinduism and in Christian mysticism, which I connoted very neatly and left it there by the little arrow I had upwards in my diagram of the subject pointing to ecstasy. I am not saying then that this is a norm of human achievement, to pay attention to the achievements of potting, in that there is a group, there's a subgroup in the human group that may be invited not to. There's a mystical orientation that is a detachment. And these, these type of people in the religious traditions are significant in that they draw attention to the non-visible, the beyond, in human life. It used to be very manifest, say, in the Catholic tradition with the nuns and priests and so on. It's still very manifest in the Buddhist tradition. It's shockingly manifest, if you like, in the Hindu culture. You see these holy people. Okay, so there is a subgroup, but in the main, the problem of the realization of the desire is to discover what the desire is. And that means to activate the desire. And the desire is whatting. And whatting is especially that zone which seeks for understanding. There's the whatting of art, and so on. But my emphasis here is on the whatting of understanding that led Aristotle from the desire, not to a tradition parallel to the Hindus, but to a, a, a perspective that emphasizes the calling of the desire. How did Aristotle find out that the human desire that he started the metaphysics with is a reach towards limitless understanding, and that this is a calling of that desire? He found this out by attending to the little achievements that he had. He did an awful lot of physics, and an awful lot of biology, and revealed to himself that this is my desire, and that desire is hearty. I have to emphasize that and bring it back to this question of the heart. Eric Vogelin stresses the fact that the, these Chap, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were not intellectuals. They were hearty men. And this understanding is hearty and heartfelt. But there is that contrast between the Hindu tradition and that Greek tradition that, well, not, let me not call it a tradition. I mentioned earlier, no, it's not a tradition. Three weird Greeks followed this up. Just as Thomas Aquinas is not a tradition, he's a very solitary fat monk in the 13th century. But it would seem, on the example of Aristotle, that insofar as you 
exercise the desire in your own poor shabby way, heartily and nescient, and attend to that, that you will discover that, yeah, what Augustine comes up with later, our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. And thee is not a vague beyond. Thee is limitless understanding. Okay, that's a little bit about the, the roots of the Indo-European tradition in the Rig Veda. And the problem of a transformation of contemplation in the various religious traditions. And even the most detached person has to admit that the universe is friendly enough to give me a bowl of rice. It's, except for those who, who really freak out religiously or have that strange calling, I, I know one very good theologianess in Canada who just took off, left it all behind, because of that calling. But there's a primary calling and an enormous need for the cultivation of the quest so that one is reaching for understanding. And this is the theological effort. Reasoning and religious belief, yes, belief calls for reasoning. It's a seed, it's a germ of spirit. And from our discussion last day, you can read a lot more into this in the sense that the spirit incognito bolsters the germ and the seed that we are. Okay, we, we have moved back to the Indo-European tradition, with a few pointers back to the cradle of mankind in Africa. We're millions of years back, but this is only 2,500 years back. Let's look a little bit towards the future. And that's what that question is, or is about. A cosmos and self as beautiful. What, what are we about? Chapter 2, the beginning of the beginning. Well, we're about this exercise from James Joyce. You, you, I, I sent out this page. Uh, it's not important to remember it. It's simply the reflection of Joyce on what constitutes the beautiful. All right. For those of you who haven't got the reference, it's, this is a Penguin edition of Joyce, uh, the portrait of an artist as a young man. It's a paperback Penguin, many times published. This is a 1975 edition. And pages 211 to 213. And I, and I won't delay on this. One could comment line by line on the subtlety and the wit of this strange man. But he takes Aquinas' three requirements for beauty. And he translates the words to suit himself, wholeness, harmony, and radiance. And this relates to the exercise I gave you about two weeks ago from section 2.5 on the notion of a thing. What's a thing? And some of you are following that up in Bernard Lonergan's book, Insight. And you will find it very interesting to see how you might connect Bernard Lonergan's notion of a thing as a unity, identity, whole. With this notion of an art object. Okay, so Joyce, much as I did with the bear the last day, Joyce said, look at this. 
look at this basket. Do you see that basket? And Lynch says, I see it. And the next line, Joyce doesn't say you do. He just says, in order to see that basket. It's, it's, a, it's a magnificent twist. Yeah? It's a bit like George Eliot's, we are well wadded with stupidity. Does Lynch see the basket? And this brings us to the question, do we, do, do we see ourselves? OK, in order to see the basket, then you see it as whole, as, as a unit, as complex, but all together, all one. And you see its whatness. Well, this is the basket, and the basket is there. Now, the point I'm raising here, and it's an exercise relating to this notion of thing, thinking of something as a unit, We've been thinking of ourselves, and surely as a unit, not ourselves just doing this course, but ourselves as, from a certain beginning, going on, how far on. The Africans and the Chinese would talk about ancestors going home, being home. The Zulu tradition doesn't talk about the, the dead as if they were dead. <laughs> it's a community. It's a large community. The thing that is me and the cosmos, and both are incomplete. And that's why I put in the question mark. How incomplete are they? I I'm raising again the question of mystery, the question of ugliness, the question of evil, the question of suffering, and putting it into a context of art. You can look at the little dancing girl of Dega. You can listen to an entire symphony of Haydn. But the cosmos, I mentioned the last day, the cosmos, finitude, it is like a mighty nocturne of which we have heard a few bars. Then is it beautiful? There's a sense in which it is not. It's incomplete. It's unknown. And we're back to this question of nescience. How much do we know? The cosmos is not like the basket. One has a reach, and it's, it's part of this desire. The desire is one. Somehow the object must be one. For wholeness, for harmony. Think, think of my parallel with the nocturne, which I bring out in chapter 5. I say, well, the universe is like the first. We've, so far, we've got the first few bars. Now, if some of you know the first few bars of some of, say, Chopin's nocturnes, do you know where it's going? I'm thinking at the moment of that marvelous first symphony of Beethoven, where he starts in the wrong place. He annoyed the hell out of the audience. He weaves around for about six, seven, eight, nine, ten bars, and then he plays the chord. People didn't like it. The universe's harmony is totally elusive. And so you get another view of the conviction of faith. That this is music, but it may sound terribly bad. The radiance, elusive. So one can think then of the cosmos as, well, is it beautiful? So far, hmm? not so good. 20th century, let's rub that one out. But the, the problem of the conviction, or the solution of the conviction of faith, is that you answer yes in hope. The Latin creed, expecto resurrectionum mortuorum, et vitam venturi. I expect. Yeah. We're back to, I know that my Redeemer liveth. We're back to the fifth verse of the Canticle of Canticles. 
I read it today, and it was very interesting because I was working on the, the African tradition, and it was, was thou art black and beautiful. Yeah? Maybe Kenneth Cowende is right. Okay, so the, the, the question of beauty is that, well, so far, no, but hope, and the hope relates to the limitless understanding that Aristotle talks about, the calling, and it relates to the, the happy fault that the Christian communities sing about as Good Friday comes up shortly. Okay, so the cosmos isn't beautiful. What about the self? Well, the basket is there, yeah? But you may be just a basket case. You're certainly incomplete. Might I pun and say you're not all there? <laughs> Reminds me of the preacher preaching in the madhouse in Ireland, and he got up and he wasn't quite sure how to start his sermon, so he said, well, my dear brethren, why are we all here? And the little man at the back said, because we're not all there. Okay, you're not all there, so you're not beautiful. Maybe. But yes, there's the hope. And there's the hope in the beauty of the self. And it's a beauty that is beyond human estimation. Yeah? It's beyond the cosmetic industry. And that, again, is a hope. And one of the major problems of the neurotic personality of our time that Karen Hornay talks about is the problem of a basic self-worth. I'm me. Not my achievements, simply me. And that fundamental self-worth is, in fact, even when not explicitly religious, it is religious. And that, the fundamental self-worth in the Christian context, and here I wind back to our discussion of the incarnate word, which I have a little bit of in chapter 5 of process, the self that is worthwhile is the self that is uniquely loved both by Jesus Christ the human and by the Trinity. I mentioned the last day that the, there is no fuss in the pews about taking time with the Lord. Shut up, I'm talking to hmm? The fundamental Christian conviction that can be dominant in a community and absent in its theologians is that the self is indeed beautiful and beloved uniquely uh, and called to Christ Ixi, that you are minded. You are the unique beloved of the incarnate divine person and his two pals. And that, to use a, a non-acceptable phrase, that's a hell of a fact. So, again, are you beautiful? Well, you, you're searching through the new man hymn that I took as the hymn of the course. One step enough for me, kindly light. And the answer to the question is yes. Does that depend on my achievement? My shape, my weight, my size, my fortune? No. So there's the possibility of a positive answer to that. Maybe. How are we doing for this, my heavens, the incomplete examination of the incomplete self? I recall the last time I, we were coming up to the midterm, and I think we had a minute left. Well. <laughs> We're not so bad tonight, but let's hear a word or two. The difficulty of this examination is that it's very odd. Certainly you can do it like the standard examination. You stay up late. Oh, no, you don't have to stay up late. It's, it's an evening examination. Well, you get up early. Maybe you don't have to get up early. You start at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and you... Memorize the 13 elements and hope for the best. Okay, and, and yeah, 
uh, I can't expect much if what I said about the course is true. It's a terribly superficial half credit. If you can vaguely remember that you have 13 elements. The great thing about this incomplete examination is that it is a three-hour examination where you can let yourself loose if you can accept yourself as beloved and beautiful. <laughs> then you're not worried about failing. You can let yourself loose, and some of my students come back and say, that was the best three hours I spent this year. Uh, you relax, and you try and answer. Now, what have you to try and answer? Well, you have to try and answer five out of 12 Five out of 12 questions. What you can do intelligently is pick five and build the answer. But the key invitation is uh, to make some progress in it. And scribble. I, I, I don't want neat handwriting. I want you to scribble. You can even swear at me. <laughs> and go back and draw arrows and so on. And if you cancel something out, don't wipe it out entirely. It's an awful job when you have the exam like that and you're trying to find out. Because generally, the interesting stuff is the stuff that people scratch out. You know, when you find in the letter from a friend that there's a blacked out part, part and many of you, you're dead curious to see, well, what was that? <laughs> OK, and, and it's an incomplete. I can give you an incomplete on the exam if you like. You're reflecting on yourself and on the project spelled out in the, the little diagram in order to answer questions about yourself as a believer, as religious, as inquiring, as communicating, as seeking understanding, faith-seeking understanding. And insofar as you do get some distance in that, then you enter a democracy, which is my final focus here. And I'm not going to enlarge on it. I was going to comment on a recent book by Hans Kuhn, Theology for the Third Millennium, an extraordinary title. Uh, you become part of a democracy because you have noticed something of enormous value, of great price. You have noticed desire. You have noticed the seed. And the people who notice that may grow in numbers. But it's not something to be expected soon. Method in Theology by Bernard Lonergan, page 253 and one-third. He talks about what we have been doing in this course. He talks about making conversion a topic. Talking about the desire. Talking about the question. If you're foolish enough, even asking professors, surely we should discuss questions. This is about children. Notice in the absence of this in dictionaries, in philosophy of science. Noticing the absence of its cultivation in the culture. That's a democracy. You, you can do it on the basis of our superficial half credit. The other part of the democracy is noticing the transformation that is that eightfold division. Any field of inquiry, it's missing. 